this moment. The fighting is going on between a Viet Cong infiltration force which came into the town in the early hours of this morning. They then tangled with these Korean guards who are guarding the... Uh, well, that's something I shall never forget. That was um, a film that we shot in the streets of Saigon during the opening day of the Tet Offensive in 1968. And it's used in a, a compilation film that was made for the BBC in, I think it was, it was transmitted in, yes, in 95, 1995, the 20th anniversary of the end of the Vietnam conflict. And the film is basically looking at how the BBC covered the war. Um, many of my colleagues take part in this, this compilation. Um, I don't really want to add very much to it because the film says it all. Uh, but there is one thing that I've, I've never really made public, and that was that um, during my time in Vietnam, and I was there on what's it, many occasions during 1966 and 75, and I think it was probably about the end of 66 um, that I got an approach from an organization in Saigon called the Just Pile, the Joint US Public Affairs Office which was really rather distressing, because they said, um, uh, we're considering taking away your accreditation. Now, without that accreditation, which basic, basically meant that you had a, a pass, which meant that you could go anywhere, or at least anywhere within reason, where it was safe to go. Um, and if they'd taken that away from me, I simply could not have operated in Vietnam as a reporter. And so I said, well, why? Why, why are you going to take it away? And they said, well, we don't think that you're... Um, your reports are balanced. We think that they're somewhat anti-American and uh, therefore we don't think it's in our interest that you should be operating here. Well, obviously, I was extremely upset. I protested long and loud, but they said, no, no, we don't think that you're doing a good job for us. I said, well, I'm not doing working for you. I'm actually working for the BBC. Anyway, I was very upset and I went and talked to the British Embassy and they were extremely helpful, particularly the um, military attaché a brigadier who had seen quite a lot of my stuff and he didn't think they were biased at all. He thought they were pretty fair, as the BBC is obviously supposed to be. And he said, don't worry, I'll speak to my friends in the American embassy and I'm quite sure we can um, make this threat recede. And indeed he did. God bless him. And uh, my accreditation was not withdrawn. I was able to go on and make some of the reports that you're going to see in this compilation. Now, everything else I want to say about reporting the Vietnam War is there. So, I hope you find it interesting. I did. There was a short firefight uh, in which three of the Viet Cong were killed. The rest of them apparently have taken refuge in a partly completed hotel. <laughs> Tonight I've announced the decision to reduce American force levels by a quarter of a million men from what they were 15 months ago. Long Bin cost nearly 50 million pounds to build and at the height of the American military commitment it was the United States Army headquarters in Vietnam. Now it's partly empty, derelict, underused and overgrown but it's still the home of 27 Vietnamese army units and was handed over to them at a short and simple ceremony. The Americans presented the Vietnamese with a token key to the 17,000 acre site. Speeches at the ceremony linked the handover of Long Bin with the hoped for peace agreement. But peace or no peace, the Americans are getting out anyway. Vietnam's biggest military base is no longer theirs. If Vietnamization is to work, this is what it depends on. The army of the Republic of Vietnam. The despised Arvin, who must shoulder the American share of the war and at least hold the line against the communists. A Viet Cong victory during the withdrawal period could destroy the credibility of the whole Nixon plan. 
What is your impression of the Vietnamese army? It's sorry. <laughs> it's about all you can say, really, because uh, they don't want to work. And uh, this makes a lot of people uh, feel like, like I felt many times, like uh, they don't want to fight for it, why should we? If some of them do lack stomach for the fight, it should surprise no one. Any male between the age of 18 and 39 is conscripted for unlimited military service. And as the Vietnamese share of the combat increases, so do their casualties, now running at four or five times the weekly American rate. Training has been greatly improved, but the fighting quality of these troops is still uncertain. Compared with the communists, it's always been said that government forces have been poorly led and lack aggression. Four years and two months ago, when I first came into this office as president, by far the most difficult problem confronting the nation was the seemingly endless war in Vietnam. 550,000 Americans were in Vietnam. As many as 300 a week were being killed in action. Hundreds were held as prisoners of war in North Vietnam. And no progress was being made at the peace negotiations. Tonight, the day we have all worked and prayed for has finally come. We have prevented the imposition of a communist government by force on South Vietnam. tremendous waste. The morning the peace treaty was signed, 6.30 in the morning, I was in my barracks about two blocks from Tansanud Air Base, brushing my teeth when the first rockets hit. And the rockets landed uh, three blocks from where I was. I thought, well, we've been here 13 years and we signed a peace, you know, peace. And in 13 years, we accomplished very little, obviously, since at the end of this time, the VC are close enough to throw rockets into the capital city of South Vietnam. So all the men that died, all the money that was spent, we accomplished nothing, not a thing. What a waste, what a joke, what a farce. Sergeant Nguyen Van Chem had one thing in common with the Americans. For him, too, the war was over. Sergeant Tiem survived three days of the peace with honor that came into force on January the 28th before he was killed in action. For him, there were military honors for all of seven minutes before the abrupt rites began again for the next burial party. Saigon's military cemetery was busier in the days following the ceasefire than at any time in the three months that preceded it. A certain discretion is called for when you set out to visit the Viet Cong. Sixty miles from Saigon, in broad daylight, we had to leave a busy government-controlled highway to make for an area known to be communist controlled. A week or two ago, it would have been unthinkable. Just off the road, we found a sympathetic villager with a sampan to take us on the first lap. We did not go unobserved. A government soldier watched our departure and delayed two other journalists. 
Back on dry land, it's possible that the peasants thought we were from the International Peace Supervisory Force. But unluckily for the village we were to visit, on the day we went, the ceasefire commission in the area was still bickering about hotel accommodation. The villagers apologised for the exuberance of the children, explaining that in the past, when foreigners had come, they'd been taught to run away. The Americans had made a sweep in this hamlet two years ago, but now it was different. We met our first Viet Cong soldier, the proud owner of an M16 rifle pilfered from an American corpse. And at the next checkpoint, we came across a small unit of Viet Cong militia. They were all from the district. That's how the communists have always maintained their power in the hamlets, creating converts from within rather than imposing power from outside. After five hours, we reached the village of Bin Phu. There's not much to the village itself. The only thing to distinguish it from a thousand Mekong villages was the welcome banner on a bamboo arch, proclaiming Hail to the Peace. And even that, we suspected, may have been erected for our special benefit. <laughs> A young officer advised us firmly that we could go no further. There was a security scare, he said. The men we were to have met had had to move. As the firing came closer, we concluded the interview and followed our final guide, a village girl, along the trail towards government territory. We'd been walking for five or six minutes when we noticed a South Vietnamese army helicopter circling directly above us. As we hurried on, we were unable to take pictures of what then happened behind us. We did record the sound. Two more government helicopters swept in and repeatedly rocketed and machine gunned the area we had just left. We don't know what happened to the guerrillas, the local officials, nor the children who had been with us all day. Talking to us in the pagoda, the communists had been expressing what appeared to be an almost naive faith in the peace and in the peace commissioners. And yet within minutes of our leaving, they were on the receiving end of what I must report as a blatant ceasefire violation by the South Vietnamese army. Certainly the villagers we know had shown no provocation. Though there is the disturbing thought that it might have been our very presence, the presence of journalists there speaking freely to the communists and hearing their point of view, that might, for the South Vietnamese army, have been justification enough, provocation enough, to blitz the village.